We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This time we invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. This we deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in reading the Psalm of the Day, which comes from Psalm chapter 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe, language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle for this morning is from Romans chapter three, beginning at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, 
Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For what we hold, that one is justified apart by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join together in singing hymn number 578.
taking your seats, I invite you to open a Bible to the Gospel of John chapter 8, where we'll begin, and we're going to look at Psalm chapter 46 as well, but we're going to start in John chapter 8 and prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning. We go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would give to us peace and comfort through the hearing of the Gospel this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in the Christ the Holy Spirit would speak to them words of comfort and encouragement and forgiveness through the hearing of the gospel. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and the gospel of Jesus for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Jesus says to the Jews, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So Jesus is proclaiming to all that believe in him that his goal for them is that they would abide in his word, and he says that his word, the gospel, will set you free. So the question is, what do we need to be set free from? Because that was the argument that the Jews who believed in Jesus in this context were arguing back saying, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone, which is not true. It's the whole story of Exodus and a lot of the Old Testament. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So Jesus is telling us that one of the truths of his word is that you and I have to acknowledge that we are sinners, right? And so when Jesus says anyone that commits sin is a slave to sin is mastered by it. So we have to admit that we are all sinners, that we've committed sin, that we're imperfect people. And what Jesus is saying is you need to be set free from that. So on the one hand, that's good news. We can be set free. On the other hand, it's bad news, which is we need to be set free in the first place. And we're just like the original audience where we think, well, I've got all kinds of freedoms. What do you mean I need to be set free? No one can tell me what to do. No one can tell me how to live my life. I'm the master of my own life, my own choices, and everything is up to me, right? This is the attitude of our culture. This is the attitude of our day. And Jesus says, actually, if you commit sin, here's a hard truth. You are a slave to sin. You are mastered by it. Here's the evidence of Jesus being truthful. How many of you have ever had to commit or have committed the same sin more than once in your life? And you're like, and you admitted it. You were really sorry about it. You're like, I don't want to do it again, Jesus. I, I'm sorry you apologized to the person you sinned against. He said, I'll never do it again. And then all of a sudden, a week later, you find yourself doing the same thing again and going, what a fool I am. I can't believe I did it again. And Jesus says, well, your problem isn't that you didn't try hard enough. Your problem is that... You are a slave to sin. It is your master, and you need to be rescued from it. You need to be set free. The other truth that Jesus is teaching here is that you cannot free yourself. This is part of the point of Reformation Sunday, and part of the movement of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation under Martin Luther, was that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition, that we need to be set free by Jesus. The gospel is what sets us free, his free forgiveness of all of your sins. So there's two truths that Jesus is teaching us today. One is that we are slaves to sin and that we need to be set free. And the other is that we cannot free ourselves, that he came to free us. And so I want to look at Psalm chapter 46, which is the basis of the great Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress, which I promise you we're going to sing later on in the service. Don't worry. I joked a few months ago that we wouldn't sing it just to see how you would react. It was just a joke. All right, we're going to sing it later, okay? All right, but Psalm 46 is the basis for that. And I want to show you three ways that Jesus sets us free from the bondage of sin through this beautiful text. So Psalm chapter 46, verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So the first thing that Jesus sets us free from is our sin. So the, 
the context of Psalm 46 is that the Assyrian army had surrounded the people of Israel in Jerusalem, and God was using that to discipline the people for their sins. They had rebelled against God. They were not worshiping God the way they were supposed to. And so God sent a foreign army to conquer them and to bring them to repentance so that they would see the error of their ways and turn back to God. And so they prayed, they repented, and then this psalm was written in response to God saving the people. So they celebrate the good news that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. What we need when we're caught in our sin is a refuge, right? We, we need a place to go where we will receive grace and mercy and forgiveness. We need a safe place to go where we know we will be loved and received through grace and mercy and forgiveness. What well, Hebrews says that we can approach the throne of God with all confidence and we can approach knowing that we will receive grace and mercy in our time of need. What is a greater time of need than when you've been convicted of your sin, right? Because how many of you have experienced the ramifications of sin in your relationships and in life and realized, I've made a mistake, I've hurt people, I've wounded people, I've messed up, and I've, I've messed up not just myself, but other people's lives, right? Because that's what sin does. And so Psalm 1 is saying, you and I have a refuge in God that we can turn to, and through Jesus Christ, when we turn to him, we know that we're going to receive grace and mercy for our time of need. So when you are tempted and you're battling against Satan, when you are falling into temptation and you, you've given in to sin and you say, I need help, the, the Bible tells you, here's the good news of Jesus. He's your refuge. You can turn to him and he will not cast you away. He will receive you with grace and mercy because of his cross and his death and his resurrection for you. And he says it's our strength and a very present help in trouble. So he's our strength because, man, we're weak. <laughs> Right? That's why you do the same sins more than once, even though you, you're trying not to. Right? How many of you leave each Sunday going, boy, I can't wait to sin some more? Right? I'm assuming most of us leave going, I hope I live a better life for Jesus this week. Right? We, we, we go out into the world with really good intentions. But because we're weak, because we're frail, because we're sinful, we, we, we fall into these traps over and over again. And we sin and we need someone that is stronger to rescue us from something we cannot rescue ourselves from. We're not strong enough to save ourselves. So the good news of the gospel is that God is our strength. He's, he's the one who is strong enough to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from temptation, to rescue us from our weaknesses, and to give us new life. And then it says he is a very present help in trouble. I love this phrase. Many of you probably know this verse and love this phrase. In the Hebrew, it literally means something that is easily found. So it's saying when you are in need of help, when you are in trouble, God is easily found. That's the promise God's word is making for you. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's not hiding from you. Right? If you remember Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sin, it's not God that hides. It's Adam and Eve that hide. God is not hiding from you. He's pursuing you and seeking you out through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit at work in your life, trying to bring you back to him. And the promise of God's word is that he's easy to find when you're in trouble. He's not going to cast you aside. He's not going to throw you away like a burden. Instead, he's easy to find and say, I'm right here to forgive you and to redeem you. In fact, if you go to Genesis 3, that's the point of the story. Adam and Eve sin and they hide in their sin because they're afraid and they're filled with shame. And it's God that walks into the garden and pursues them asking, where are you? And that's what God does for us. He's easily found. He's asking us, where are you? Why? You went off the road. You went off the path. You sinned. You didn't walk the way I wanted you to walk. But here I am to find you and redeem you and bring you back home. One of my favorite images of all time is a statue at my home church. It's a statue of Jesus whatever he's supposed to look like, with a lamb over his shoulders. And the point is that it's based on the parable of Jesus says, I go and seek the lost sheep. I leave the 99 to go find the one lost one. And when I find it, I put it on my shoulders and carry it back home. 
This is what the gospel promises you. This is what God's word in Psalm 46 promises you, is that God, Jesus, is easily found and that he is pursuing you in your trouble and in your sins and your guilt and your shame, and he wants to carry you back home to him. That's the good news. He sets us free from our sin. The second thing is that he sets us free from fear. Therefore, verse 2, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So what the author is saying is basically the world's falling apart, <laughs> right? And many of us have had moments like that where we feel like life is crashing down all around us. We can't see the next step. We don't know the future. We don't know the way to go. And everything feels like the mountains are now in the bottom of the ocean and the oceans are roaring and overwhelming us and everything is chaos and the psalmist says but we're not going to be afraid right now on the one hand that sounds like your friend when you are filled with fear and worry coming alongside you go don't worry about it which is never helpful advice right anybody ever found that to be helpful until right anybody ever told that person thank you I never thought of that right no usually we're going yeah I'm trying not to but I am But there's a promise here that is bigger than just friendly advice of, well, don't be afraid. These are not cheap words. This is a promise based on the truth of God's word that says, we will not be afraid even though all of this is happening around us. Even though it feels like the world is falling apart, we're not going to be afraid because God is with us. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So he's saying God is with us, right? That's the Christmas story that Jesus is God with us. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So there's not a time in your life where God is not with you through the promise of the Holy Spirit, through the presence of Jesus Christ. And so he is in the midst of her, saying he's in the midst of us. And then I love that it says, she shall not be moved. Well, everything else is being moved. The ocean's being moved, the waters are roaring and foaming, and the mountains are at the bottom of the ocean. That, that is the chaos that they are, the people of Israel are facing at that time. They're saying everything in the world is being moved. And then because God is with us, it says, she will not be moved. We have a sure foundation, says the book of Hebrews. A sure foundation and a kingdom that cannot be shaken or taken away from us because it is based on Jesus Christ and his love for you. In 1 John, it says, perfect love casts out all fear. And it's a reminder that you and I, through Jesus Christ, have been loved perfectly. So even though the mountains sometimes move and go to the bottom of the ocean, sometimes the oceans overwhelm us and the waters flood and everything feels like chaos, he's saying, but the church, God's people, will not be moved because he is with them. The other reason we can trust this promise of not fearing is verse 7. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. So again, God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The phrase, the Lord of hosts, um, in Hebrew means angelic armies. So he's saying the God of angelic armies is on our side. Romans, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right, so the author of the scriptures, the author of the psalms is saying, you don't have to be afraid because God is with you. And the kind of God that is with you is the God of angelic armies. And for the people of Israel who are surrounded by the Assyrian Empire at this time, what a powerful promise that is. To say, you don't have to worry, you don't have to be afraid of what is in front of you because I am with you and I am greater and more powerful than anything in the world. So whatever we are facing, we can face with confidence, we can face with trust in God because he is with us and because he is the God of angelic armies, he's able to overcome anything we are facing. And then finally, number three, probably the hardest one that Jesus sets us free from is, the, is striving, trying to do it ourselves. How many of you like doing things yourself because you'll do it right and you can't trust anybody else to do it? A few of you are raising your hands, right? We've got a few perfectionists in the building, right? That's what uh, group projects in school teach you, is to not trust fellow humans, right? Because they won't get it done, and you're going to have to do it all to get the A, right? So we, we have this idea in our hearts and our minds that 
if I want something done perfectly, if I want something done right, I got to do it myself. I can't trust anybody else. There's a real problem with that when it comes to our faith. Because we start to tell God, I can't trust you. I've got to do it myself. So we start striving. We start doing all the work ourselves, trying to say, I'll fix it. I'll overcome on my own. I'll conquer this sin on my own. I'll set myself free. And the whole point of the gospel is, and the word of God is Jesus telling you, you can't free yourself, but I can free you. So trust in me. So verse 10 of Psalm 46, super famous verse, be still and know that I am God. How many of you know this verse? And how many of you have said it to yourself a million times trying to calm yourself down a little bit, right? Be still and know that I'm a God. Literally in the Hebrew, it means to let go or stop gripping something. So think of holding on tightly with a, a bound fist. It says, it's, it's up to me. I've got to do it myself. And what the word of God is telling you is, why don't you let go and loosen your grip? Because God is in control. That's his promise to you. He's saying, be still, right? (laughs) It's hard for us to be still as human beings and to fully trust that God's got this and that God will take care of me, that he will handle this situation that feels uncertain. We're completely surrounded. The mountains are in the sea. The oceans are roaring. Everything is chaos. And God looks at you and says, I want you to let go and stop gripping so tightly. I want you to trust me in all things. Now, on the one hand, that's a beautiful promise, isn't it? God's saying, I'm I'm gonna take care of you. That's what it means to say, and be still and know that I am God. It means, it's a phrase of trust. Trust that I'm God, that I'm in control. I know the future, I will take care of you. And yet, what do we wanna do as humans? I had a friend one time tell me that they're constantly giving things to God and taking them right back. (laughs) I was like, man, that's a great picture of the human life. (laughs) Here you go, God. Okay, I'll take that right back. Here you go, God. Oh, it's been a few minutes. You didn't take care of it. Let me take it back and hold on to it tightly. I was like, man, what a great summary of the human heart. But here's the good news of the gospel that Jesus has come to set you free from that striving, from that death grip you have on life and on the future, all the worry and fear that you're holding on to. And he's saying, you can let go, you can stop gripping it so tightly, and you can trust me that I am a good God who will guide you and take care of you. At the very end of our reading in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this in verse 36 of John chapter 8. He says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, here's the good news of the Gospel. Jesus has set you free and you are free indeed because of what he has done through his death and resurrection. So you can fully trust him. You can let go. You can stop gripping onto your fears and worries so tightly because you know he is with me. He has set me free for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your gospel, for the good news that you have set us free, free from sin and fear and striving that we can simply trust in you and your perfect work of your death and resurrection that has set us free and forgiven all of our sins and given to us the gift of salvation. May we let go and trust you in all things in life, Lord, our salvation and tomorrow. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go to our God in prayer.
Heavenly Father, look with mercy upon us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all of the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. Invite the congregation to stand as we join together and sing in the offertory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing Thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. November 17th, after service, there will be a voters meeting in the sanctuary. That's November 17th. And as you might have noticed, construction has finally begun, so we praise God for that process. We also thank God for all the volunteers that helped this morning and are going to be helping in the future to make sure access to the building is um, as smooth as possible. And we also thank the congregation for your patience during this time. Um, also, because construction is going on, uh, beginning this Sunday, the fellowship time and Bible class hour will happen downstairs in the fellowship hall which makes sense. It's Fellowship Hall. We should have fellowship time down there. We're finally doing it. There we go. All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.